All right. Uh, hi, everyone. So um, this is actually my second time in, in Krakow. I was here uh, just over 11 years ago. I was sitting in a, a hotel having breakfast, and three people walked into the, into the room. I knew two of them. I didn't know the third one. The third one was a, was a woman. Um, they sat down at my table, and we said hello to each other. And then a year later, we were married. And yeah, and uh, you'd be happy to know that we're still married. Um, so I have very good memories of this city. Um, I don't remember what I was eating for breakfast, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't the food that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, and <clears throat> I work for a company called the Good Food Institute. And um, one of the big problems that we think about is how are we going to feed 10 billion people uh, by 2050? Because that's predicted to be what the population of the world is going to be at that point. Um, and we do it through four program areas. We're a nonprofit, and you can think of us like a think tank. And our goal, our mission, is to accelerate the amount of research in both plant-based meat and clean meat, and I'll talk about those in a bit. And we do this through four program areas. The top one on the left is about innovation. So we, we assess the industries, we find out where there are opportunities for research and innovation, and then we find scientists in universities and in companies to do that research, and we find uh, money to make it happen as well. We support startups, so any entrepreneur that's interested in creating a startup, closer, there. Um, any entrepreneur that's inter interested in creating a startup uh, around plant-based meat or clean meat, we can help you with that. Um, we also have a corporate engagement department that works with all of the big restaurants, grocery stores, food suppliers to get more plant-based foods uh, on menus and on shelves. And then finally, we spend a lot of time educating institutions. So those could be governments, funding bodies, universities, about the promise of this, this industry and why they should invest people and money in it. So um, back to that question that 10 billion people question. These four animals here uh, provide the majority of the food that, or majority of the meat that we consume today on a daily basis. Down at the bottom is the fin fish, and the fin fish is the most efficient. It converts just 12% of calories in uh, to food out. The chicken next is, as you probably know, has been relentlessly optimized for efficiency but it's still pretty bad, right? It takes nine calories of energy in to produce just one calorie of food. And the pig, about the same, 10% efficient. And then the cow up at the top requires a massive 100 calories of energy in to produce just one calorie of food. That's just a 1% energy conversion rate. So all of these are terrible, right? And it's a food system that just that doesn't work today, and it's certainly not gonna work in uh, in 2050 when there's another 3 billion people on the planet. So to feed those 10 billion people, we need a far more sustainable and efficient food system. And our food system isn't just bad, um, it isn't just inefficient, it's also bad for the planet. Um, it negatively impacts human health through lifestyle diseases, zoonotic diseases, antibiotic resistance. Billions of animals each year are treated cruelly on factory farms, and it has disastrous effects on our environment. Um, animal agriculture is one of the leading causes for the loss of biodiversity, and it's responsible for up to 91% of Amazon rainforest destruction. So, despite everyone knowing all of these things, or at least a rising awareness and acceptance that factory farming is bad, People continue to eat more meat. Meat production and meat consumption continue to rise. And this isn't just due to the rising population of the world. People in all areas of the world are eating more and more meat. So if continuing to tell people that eating meat is bad for a, a variety of reasons isn't the solution, what is? So, there are many examples of where new technologies and markets have rapidly transformed an established industry. And our food industry is no different. 
meat made from plants is already changing the way consumers behave. And meat made from cell culture and tissue engineering is poised to do the same and more. And I'll talk about both of those. And so why do we think that this trend is going to continue and transform our food industry? So I'll talk a little bit about some, some market trends. The first one that's really interesting is to, is to look at plant-based milk as, as an example of what can happen. So about five, 10 years ago, the plant-based milk market was less than 1%, uh, had a less than 1% share of the total dairy market. And then it grew to now uh, a 10% market share. And this didn't happen because people suddenly started caring about cows and wanted to eat plant-based milk. It happened for three reasons. The taste of plant-based milks improved, the price went down, and most importantly, the convenience of those milks changed. So they moved from the dusty corner where the other sort of eco-friendly products were to the refrigerated section. And it's now sold right next to dairy milk. And this exploded this, this market. And we think the same thing is gonna happen with, with plant-based meat, which at the moment is almost just noise in the whole meat market. So it's like less than a quarter of 1% market share, but it's starting to grow rapidly. And we see the same trend happening. In fact, we see growth in meat substitute demand everywhere. And fortunately, Poland isn't on this, but I would guess, um, unless someone knows, um, that it's up. The growth is, is very similar to what we see in other European countries like, um, like Germany and Austria. Um, so it's growing rapidly all over the world. What's interesting when we look at the different um, segments of of uh, alternatives to either dairy or meat, is that the plant-based uh, milk segment there in the middle, that, that, that tall bar, the growth is actually slowing. And what uh, we found, in at least in the US, and I think this is true uh, around the world, is that more than 90% of households that buy uh, plant-based milks still buy dairy milk. So what does that mean? It means that the plant-based milks are not uh, delivering all of the uh, features that are, and qualities that, that people are used to from dairy milk, right? So it might be they might need it for baking something or some recipe that they really think it needs uh, da dairy milk in it. Now, I think we can still improve the, the quality of plant-based milks so they become more and more like dairy milk. But the other reason um, is that I think people are there's just some people that are still gonna want to get milk from animals. And that's where clean, clean meat and cellular agriculture come in, which I'll talk about. But first, I'll talk a little bit about um, plant-based meat. So what we did at um, the Good Food Institute was dive into this plant-based meat area and look at all of the, of the different technologies that are required to um, create a plant-based meat. meat. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of these, you'll be uh, happy to hear, but I, I do want to talk about um, three, two main areas. Upstream, what we do to the crops to make them better for plant-based meat, and then downstream, how we modify those crops once we have them so that we can make better plant-based meats. So Bill Gates um, said about a year ago that only 8% of the world's plants have been studied for um, use in food. So imagine that, right? There's like all these plants in the world and only a very small percentage of them have actually been looked at to see whether they can be useful for food. And even with the, the crops we do use, um, none of them have been optimized for plant-based foods. Um, most of the foods that exist today, plant-based meat, use either soy or wheat. And those are really just byproducts of either the livestock feed industry or the uh, oil, the biofuel industry. So what, what's starting to happen now is that we're exploring both existing crops and all of the other plants in, in the world to see which ones are best suited for, for plant-based meat. So we're starting to collect, for example, digital phenotyping data, genome sequencing data, other uh, nutritional profiles, functionality information, and collecting all of that in a database so that we can look and see, okay, these, these plants are the best ones uh, for making plant-based meat. Or 
these plants look pretty good, but they're missing some key qualities. And that's where precision breeding comes in. So we can either use traditional breeding methods or gene editing to introduce or remove certain qualities of, of crops to make them better suited for creating plant-based meats. And what that'll do is improve the functionality and performance of those crops and then drive down the cost at the same time. And once we have those crops, we then need to isolate and functionalize um, specific ingredients in those, right? So we might want to um, pull out the proteins from certain plants and then use them as ingredients in, in plant-based meats. And there's a lot of innovation happening around the methods to do that so that we're not stripping away all of the, the key nutrients that are present in plants, that we're retaining those, but then pulling out the necessary ingredients that we need um, to produce plant-based meats. And then down at the bottom, um, this shows an example of a new technology that's being developed in the Netherlands to texturize plant proteins. So historically, this has been done with huge uh, machines called twin screw extruders. They cost over a million dollars and they apply intense uh, heat and pressure to plant, plant material to make it uh, texturized so it's more like uh, meat. Um, but this uh, is not very efficient, it requires huge amounts of energy, and it does a lot of bad things to the plant material as well. So scientists are now starting to look at much more environmentally friendly ways to uh, texturize protein so that it uh, feels and tastes like meat, but doesn't lose all of those uh, nutritious elements of plants, and also isn't so unkind to the environment as well. Um, one of the really exciting areas, at least for me, that's going on in plant-based meat research is, is really applying advanced biochemistry. Um, and in some cases, really not that advanced, just applying biochemistry to the science of plant-based meat. Um, on the left is a picture of um, soy, le soy like hemoglobin, which is a, a key ingredient in the Impossible Burger, which is a, a new plant-based burger that um, was launched, I think, about a, a year ago or so. Um, the, the scientists at Impossible Foods identified uh, hemoglobin as one of the key components in meat in, uh, in a beef burger that gives it the, the taste and color that um, consumers associate with that product. And so they found a version of heme in, in soy and then isolated that. Um, they now produce it in yeast and add that as a, a component into the, this plant-based burger to give it um, a red look um, and a more meat-like taste. I've actually uh, drank that liquid and it's metallic in taste. It tastes kind of like blood. Um, so pretty incredible stuff is happening as scientists start to dissect meat and understand all of the components that, go, that make up meat um, and then find um, similar components in the plant kingdom to do the same thing. They're also looking at um, volatile compound analysis. So again, dissecting meat and understanding all of the aromas that um, come out when you cook meat and then finding similar components in the plant kingdom that can be introduced into that, um, into that product to give it the same sort of sizzle and smell when you cook a plant-based burger as you would a regular uh, beef burger. And then third is around fat encapsulation. So we're starting to look at better ways to um, encapsulate plant fats so that they behave more like animal fats in, in food as well. So they don't, for example, just seep out when you start to cook your plant-based burger that they're, they're held inside and give uh, the burger that sort of juicy texture that um, consumers want. So all of this work is, is working towards um, producing meat analogs that are Essentially, essentially biomimics of the, of the animal product. So closer and closer, every year we get closer and closer to producing products from plants that are almost identical to um, products from meat. And I, I think in, you know, in another four or five years, we'll see products on the market that are completely plant-based where consumers have a very hard time uh, deciding whether it, it, it actually came from plants or it came from an animal. Pretty exciting stuff. So let's talk about something even more exciting, I think, and that's clean meat, or sometimes it's called in vitro meat or cultured meat. Um, and, you know, um, thinking back to plant-based meat, so 
I, I think that many consumers will reduce their animal meat consumption as more and more of these great plant-based meat products come on the market. But there's often an underlying cultural or individual reason for many people wanting to continue eating um, meat from animals. And that's where clean meat comes in. This is actually um, a picture of Duck a l'Orange from Memphis Meats, a clean meat company. Um, and it's produced through cells. It's not produced through, um, it doesn't come from a duck. Um, and clean meat is the same as meat produced from uh, animal agriculture. It has the same cell types, muscle, fat, and connective tissue. It looks and tastes the same, but arguably better. It doesn't require antibiotics. It doesn't require animal slaughter. And the risk of contamination from something like E. coli or another uh, microorganism is uh, almost non-existent. So how do we make clean meat? Well, the science is pretty well understood. It's adapted from the cell therapy industry. And very simply, um, you take a cell biopsy from an animal, and that's a teeny tiny biopsy. It can be done through pain-free methods. And that small biopsy is sufficient to produce massive amounts of clean meat. So you'd only really need to do that um, once and, and not very often after that. Those cells are then placed in a, in a bioreactor uh, or cultivator along with a nutrient broth called cell culture media. And that media provides all of the nutrients the cells need to grow and divide. The cells proliferate, and then once they reach a sufficient quantity, they're then taken and placed inside a different bioreactor or cultivator. And along with the, the cells, there'll be a change in the cell culture media, and also a scaffold will be introduced. And that scaffold would, would be either biodegradable or edible. And that scaffold provides structure to the cells so that they can grow in, in a three-dimensional shape. Those changes in conditions cause the cells to now differentiate into the muscle, fat, and connective tissue that um, makes up meat. And that whole process from the cell to the meat at the end takes about a month. So it's way faster than the time it takes to grow an animal for food. And once we're at commercial scale and we're using big bioreactors, we'll be able to produce in the region of 3,500 kilograms of, of clean meat from a single large bioreactor. Um, so how do we get from the point where we are today where there's about uh, you know, 20 or so companies um, working on clean meat in, in the lab to where we can actually find it in grocery stores. So the main challenge um, facing clean meat today is cost. And there are three primary vectors um, to making clean meat cheaper. The first is optimizing those cells I spoke about so that they can produce the right combination of muscle, fat, and connective tissue more efficiently than is possible today. The second is replacing the um, very expensive pharmaceutical grade ingredients inside cell culture media with food grade components. And that process will drive down the cost of the cell culture media, which is a big barrier at the moment. Um, it'll drive it down significantly. And then the third is scale. So as I mentioned, this clean meat isn't going to be produced in the lab. It's going to be produced in big, clean manufacturing facilities like this one, um, very similar to what's used today to manufacture pharmaceuticals or to even brew beer. Um, and once scale goes up, efficiency will go up, the impact on human health and, and animal welfare will go down. And what's great as well is the overall impact on the environment um, will go down as well. So the the studies that have been done thus far on clean meat uh, predict that there's going to be an increase in the amount of energy usage compared to conventional animal agriculture. Uh, but I think um, you know, those analyses, analyses have looked at the facilities of today. And I think by the time this is commercially viable, the facilities are going to be using far more um, efficient and sustainable materials and processes and energy sources than the facilities of today. But even if energy usage goes up, the impact on global warming goes down, and that's primarily due to the reduction in gas emissions, so uh, basically no more cow farts, right? Um, eutrophication goes down, 
and that's due to the elimination of animal waste that currently flows into all of our rivers and, and lakes as a result of factory farming. And then, even though these clean meat manufacturing facilities are going to be large, the amount of land that they require is going to be far, far less than what's currently required for animal agriculture. Over, those are soy plants growing there. Over 90% of the soy we grow today around the world is fed to livestock animals. And that land we free up can be used for carbon sequestration or clean energy production to offset any increases in energy usage from clean meat manufacturing. Um, the clean meat industry is in a, in a very exciting phase. It's, it's really an exciting time to be part of it. And um, you know, if you think back just a couple years to 2014, there was one company working on clean meat. By 2016, there were three. This year we have um, around about 20 companies focused on developing, developing clean meat. And those are all powered by scient amazing scientists and engineers, and most of them are looking for um, new people to join their companies. And they're also powered by investors, uh, such as these guys. Um, Richard Branson and, and Bill Gates have invested in both clean meat and plant-based meat. Um, and even meat companies like PHW in Europe and Tyson here in, um, in, in the US have invested in both plant-based meat and, and clean meat. So even meat companies see that this is where the, the future of, of food is going. Um, and I really like this quote from Richard Branson. He says, in, in 30 years, all meat will either be clean or, or plant-based. And I, I believe him. I think that's where we're going. And I don't even, I don't look at plant-based meat and clean meat as two distinct industries, two separate types of technology. I think what we'll see um, in the future, probably when the first clean meat products come to market, is a, is a hybrid, a, a spectrum of different types of products, right? So if you look over on the left, you've got sort of very fully plant-based, whole food plant-based products like tofu. And then all the way on the right, You've got companies using um, cellular agriculture and synthetic biology to produce things like gelatin that are used in many, many products, but to creating a synthetic version of that, so we don't need animals for that. But then in the middle, you've got products like the Impossible Burger, right, which uses synthetic biology to produce that, that hemoglobin that I spoke about. But I expect that we'll see these products in the middle, these clean meat hybrid products, where you might have, for example, a plant-based burger, and then they add a little bit of clean fat to it to give it that, that missing sort of component of taste and texture that consumers are looking for. So I think this is, in the future, this is what we'll see as a spectrum of, of food that replaces uh, meat from, factory, from animals from factory farms. And, you know, to think about where we're going, um, I like to show this, this image. So, that phone on the left, at least I'm old enough to remember using one of those. Probably most people in here aren't. Um, but, uh, you know, we used to use that device to call our friends and families. We used to use another device to take pictures, um, another device to play games and find our way to places. And then a single device changed the way we do all of those things and, and more. And, um, Clean meat and plant-based meat have the potential to do the same thing to our food industry, to radically transform it, um, to produce, provide food that's sustainable, inexpensive, and environmentally friendly for the world. And just like how it would now feel so strange to use that phone on the left to call someone, I'm convinced that in the not-too-distant future, the idea of growing crops, massive amounts of crops, to feed them to animals so that we can eat those animals will feel completely absurd. I think that um, markets and food technologies are going to save the world, change the world. Thanks. Questions? Yes. So about cultured meat. Meat. I wanted to ask, um, now from a cow we get an X amount of kilos of meat and from then if we can use cultured meat, how many 
uh, kilograms will we have from the cow? So what, how will the conversion rate, rate basically rate rise? You know what I mean? So now we get from the cow, I don't know, like 600 kilograms or something? Yeah, so if you think, if you think back to that uh, picture I had of the process where you had the cells on the left and the bioreactors in the middle, so one small biopsy of cells, um, that can be the starting population for hundreds or thousands of processes. So, and just from taking a small uh, amount of that biopsy and then cult uh, expanding those cells so that they, uh, and adding them to, adding the cell culture media so that they divide um, over and over again and using that bioreactor system that I mentioned, you'll be able to, just from one single bioreactor process, you'll be able to create 3,500 kilograms of, of meat. So if From a one, cow is... one cell? Or uh, several cells, several yeah. Cells. So if a cow today provides 600 kilograms, you're talking about six times that. But then you can go back to the same biopsy again, right? And do the process over and over again. So it's exponentially more kilograms of meat from just a tiny population of cells from one animal. Okay, um, demanding ones for me with the cable, but we're gonna make it. Yes, that was first one. So at the beginning you were talking about replacing, uh, for example, milk with uh, plant-based uh, uh, yeah. uh, drinks. <laughs> so um, I, I got the point, I agree with it, but uh, I'm just wondering, are those substitutes always a good quality? For example, I don't really buy soy milk or almond milk because when I am checking the ingredients, there are um, ki various kinds of thickeners or artificial colors. I mean, I highly doubt that the highest quality of rice, for example, or almonds are used to produce those kinds of drinks. And uh, on the, uh, also, there is another point. Soy is no longer considered to be a healthy, right? There is many people uh, who don't digest soy properly. So what I'm saying is, um, is it always good to, I mean, re I understand replacing dairy with uh, some kind of substitutes, but maybe it would be better to, I don't know, educate people to, for example, um, drink less milk or eat um, meat seldom and um, just because you know also the nutritious value of meat is completely different than plant-based uh, burgers yeah that, thank you there was a there was a lot of questions in there so um, and please uh, remind me if I forget one of them so I think you're right about some of the plant-based milks um, some of the, the ones that have been on the market for uh, a fair amount of time perhaps are not um, the, the best, right? They have a lot of additives and things, but I think what we're seeing is that the, um, the industry uh, is, is changing, right? So there's some newer plant-based milks on the market that, um, for example, there's a, a, a brand called Ripple um, that uses pea uh, protein to produce dairy and uh, to produce milk. And it's, um, it has fewer ingredients, and it, I think, tastes, uh, I don't really like, uh, I never really liked dairy milk, but I think this ripple milk, what I've been told is that it tastes more like um, dairy milk. It's kind of thicker and creamier. So I think that um, you're right, but I think the industry is aware of that and is developing um, plant-based milks that are, uh, are closer and closer to dairy milk. And it would be great, if we could just tell everyone to eat less uh, meat, animal meat, and drink less dairy. But um, people have been doing that for 20, 50 years, and it hasn't changed anything, really. So the younger generation is starting to, to realize that they should consume less, but overall, um, the amount of meat that uh, is being produced and consumed is growing and growing. So telling people that they should uh, eat less meat is good, but it doesn't seem to impact globally the amount of animals that are killed and the amount of meat that's eaten. So that's why we think um, we still need to create these alternative um, 
alternative products. I missed the last bit. Um, I'm just uh, saying that, for example, soy is often GMO, right? Yeah. So it's not really healthy. I mean, we cannot really tell. There are studies we still don't know. Um, what I'm saying is that um, we cannot just tell people to replace meat with something else and tell them that it's the same nutritious value, because it's not. Yeah, that's true. But I think... Um, and I wasn't really talking about well, like telling people, like trying still to educate them. Because um, I know that my friends, um, they, they live a really... Uh, they have a really healthy lifestyle. I mean, it, so they are pretty aware of what they are eating. And uh -huh. So I, I think that education works, basically. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that um, education works for, um, for some and unfortunately not for everyone. So these, these um, meat analogs and uh, plant-based milk products are not for you and your friends, right? Because you're, you understand how you can eat maybe a whole foods plant-based diet and get all of the nutrients you need and be healthy. I, I myself are, am vegan and I, I don't eat many of these products myself, but for the vast, I mean, around the world, there's about 3% uh, of the population is, is vegan. If you look at younger generations, it's, it's higher, but it's still a small percentage of the total population of the world. And so these, the reason we're developing these products or that companies are is to convert all those other people, right, that, um, that want to keep eating um, food that comes from animals. And I think, again, you're, you're right about the nutritional content. Um, but as these products, uh, as these companies innovate more and more, um, they're actually creating products that are um, nutritionally, in, in the ways that they should be, nutritionally equivalent to, say, animal meat, but, for example, not having cholesterol or some of the bad um, attributes of meat. So I, I think these companies are, in, are conscious of this and are developing better products. And I think there is additional aspect, or ethical aspect, right? That oh, sure, yeah. That Beyond just the, the health, the, I mean, just removing the need to kill animals for food is um, great, and the environmental benefits. So there, there's so many positives beyond just the, the health um, aspects that we just spoke about. Okay, uh, question, there was one here. If you can just come closer. Yeah, let's try. Um. Have you already solved the bovine ser serum problem? Yeah. I was going to mention that and then I figured someone would ask. So um, fetal bovine serum is, uh, is taken from, um, it's a byproduct of the cattle industry and it's used to culture cells. Um, and it's compared to these uh, serum-free medium formulations that I'll speak about in a minute, it's much cheaper. So it's an easy way for scientists um, to culture cells and make them divide or make them differentiate into a tissue like meat. Um, and so many of the clean meat companies today, because they're in the um, research phase, still in the lab, they're still using this um, fetal bovine serum because it's, it's cheap and it generally works. Um, but the pharmaceutical industry, um, they moved away from using fetal bovine serum about 15 years ago because it, um, it provides a lot of inconsistencies. So every batch you get is, is very different and that caused the cells um, that they were working with to behave differently and the drugs or vaccines that they were trying to create from those cells to not be the same every time. So they developed these so-called serum-free media formulations that um, use the, have the same or at least some of the proteins inside fetal bovine serum in, in them, but they're synthesized, um, they're just uh, uh, chemically synthesized. So there already exists today a solution for this, and this is called serum-free media, and I, I mentioned this very briefly in my presentation. The problem with it is that it's super expensive because it's designed for the pharmaceutical industry, and you know, as you probably know, they can charge basically whatever they want for a drug, right? So they don't really care about um, these kind of costs. But obviously for something like clean meat, we need to take these serum-free media formulations, which now cost several hundred dollars a liter, and we need to bring them down to a couple of dollars a liter. 
Um, but we've done an analysis on this and we, we know that it's possible. So it's just replacing those expensive ingredients with um, food grade components. So kind of to come back to your original question, it sucks that these companies are using fetal bovine serum today because it, it harms animals in the process. But they're aware that that's not the long-term solution and we're working with them to create these um, food grade serum free medium formulations. Okay, uh, yeah, one here, one there, one there. I see uh, all of you, yes. Uh, what is your position of, on uh, GMO? Uh, well, that could be a whole other presentation. Um, I think that uh, as a scientist, I think that genetic uh, modification or genetic engineering is a very powerful tool and if used correctly, can do fantastic things. I think that um, some of the companies that have uh, used genetic modification um, or genetic engineering um, have not done it in very ethical ways um, and this has created problems for farmers and, and other issues as well with um, things like glyphosate being everywhere, um, which isn't good. Um, but I think if it's done properly, I think that um, genetic engineering or genetic modification, um, even using the newer technologies like CRISPR, to modify crops, for example, so that they produce better protein profiles to create plant-based meats, if it's done correctly, I don't see any issues with it. In general, it's a very safe technology. It's just how it's been deployed in certain uh, examples has been pretty bad. Plus, there are many tests before the food is going to the... Oh, sure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you just come? Yes, I would appreciate that. So, two brief ones. Uh, first one regarding the cultivating. Uh, you, uh, as I understood, you said that we can uh, extract painlessly the cells that we need from the sample. And then, as I understood, uh, when we run out, we just repeat the procedure. Uh, is that the process right now? Because uh, I was wondering if we can just rely on the already extracted and cultivated cells to just ad infinitum, you know, repl replicate them in. Yeah. Uh, so and the second one is, can we create by introducing fat, like different kinds of uh, muscles from animals or just like general beef muscle is cultivated and we just keep repeating that one? Because, you know, different, like, different dishes for different parts of animal as it goes. Thank you. Yeah, great questions. Um, so there's a, a technique called uh, immortalization that can be applied to cells so that they, um, they become immortal. Um, and so I think that um, eventually uh, the clean meat companies will, will utilize this technology, or they might, so that you can take that single biopsy of cells and then immortalize them so that you don't have to go back and keep taking biopsies um, from animals. So one of the projects we're working on right now is to create a, a cell bank of different um, uh, cell lines from different um, farm animals. Um, first, so scientists can study them more and understand how to most more efficiently produce meat from them, but also to act as a repository so people don't have to uh, use animals to get these cells repeatedly. Um, and then your second question around sort of the different um, cuts of meat. Uh, yeah, so this is, I think right now the clean meat companies are focused on just getting like a product out. And many of them are focused on more simple products like pâtés and uh, ground meats and things like that that are uh, more simple to produce. But eventually that's obviously what they want to be able to do is to create um, every kind of meat that people eat today. So, um, and you're right that it's a, it's a certain combination of muscle, fat, and connective tissue and, and other ingredients that give certain cuts of meat or certain meats from certain animals different tastes and te textures. And so I think um, all of that isn't yet understood, but I expect that eventually that's what we'll get to. Um, and you know, you can think beyond what it, What's interesting, at least for me, to think about is thinking beyond the animals that um, are currently used to produce meat. So who's to say that right, a chicken is the best um, animal for us to use for, for nutritious meat? Uh, probably isn't, right? But once you've got um, this clean meat process in place, you can essentially create meat from, from any animal. You could even, um, if you wanted, like 
have a woolly mammoth burger, maybe, um, if you can get the cells from, you know, from extinct animals. So we can think beyond, if we would like to, beyond these four animals that I showed in the beginning and think about, like, if we really want to eat meat from animals, let's find um, animals that produce the most nutritious and healthy meat and take a biopsy from them and then use, use those cells to create meat in the future. No one asked about cannibalism yet. No, no. Question? Uh, one thing is about that, uh, you mentioned the cultured meat. I talked like three weeks ago, I'll talk with the one startup three weeks ago and they told me that they just puncture and take the specific type of uh, muscle fiber from different parts and they told me it was like 300k dollars to make a burger for now. Something to add if someone wants to know the actual now uh, the prices. But the second thing you mentioned TVP or texture vegetable protein. So it's mainly made from soy. I believe it's the only version. They're probably the bamboo one, but it's like a minimal amount of the others. But the soy comes with uh, a few uh, downsides. Uh, you know that they they are rich in uh, phytoestrogens, so like something that is like estrogens, and uh, your body thinks like you took the estrogen shot. And there are uh, plenty of uh, disadvantages of it, like premature uh, growing, like the little kids are uh, growing, are starting menstruating in like 10 years of age for now, or the, some kind of um, connection with uh, you know, breast cancer, or somehow uh, the increase of breast size, even in, ma in males. So what do you think about that? Or there is option to just take off the soy at all and to replace it with something else? Yeah, so the first question was about um, the cost of, of clean meat or cultured meat. And you're right, that the, so the first um, clean hamburger was um, developed by Mark Post um, in the Netherlands a, a, a few years ago. And I, I don't remember how much it cost, but it's cra a crazy amount. How, how much? $250,000. And, um, but as I spoke about in my presentation, this is the main challenge with clean meat right now. But um, if we optimize the cells and reduce the cost of the cell culture media and scale, um, we don't see any reason why um, the, the cost can't come down to be competitive with even the cheapest of meats. Um, so there's no, there's no sort of missing technology that needs to be invented to make clean meat um, viable and competitive. It's really just getting more people to work on it, getting more funding to help those people work on it, and scaling everything up and reducing the cost of some of the inputs to clean meat production. So I, I'm very optimistic about the, um, the eventual cost of, of clean meat. You know, in my the slide before this, I had a picture of the iPhone. I think the development costs for the iPhone were like over a billion dollars, right? So that's how technologies start, right? They're very expensive in the beginning, um, but then the cost comes down as, as more people work on it and the scale goes up. So, um, and that's what we believe is gonna happen with clean meat. Um, your second question was about um, TVP or tex texturized vegetable protein. So um, yeah, you're right that it comes from uh, most of it comes from soy, but really you can make that from any plant, um, any starting plant. So when I, s in the middle of my presentation, when I spoke about what, where there are opportunities for innovation with um, plant-based meat, what we're starting to look at or what scientists are starting to look at is other, other crops that are better suited for plant-based meat. So is soy the right um, input for a plant-based meat? Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, but let's look at all the other ones and see which ones there might be in the plant kingdom that are better. A lot of people are now starting to use pea um, because it, it's far less allergenic than some of the other crops we use. Um, it has a high protein content. Um, it's easy to work with. It gives the right kind of texture profile that people are looking for with um, plant-based foods. So there's already a lot of innovation um, in looking at other plant sources. Um, another interesting one is like mung bean. So there's a, a, a company called Hampton Creek, which is now called Just, and they've just released a scrambled egg product, and it's made from mung bean. And it, uh, I, um, I've not tasted it yet, but I'm told it, it 
tastes and feels in your mouth exactly like scrambled egg. Yeah, they make uh, plant-based mayo, yeah. And then, um, I'm not a nutritionist, but um, a lot of those uh, problems that you mentioned with soy, like the estrogen thing, have been debunked. So the, a lot of that isn't, isn't actually uh, true. So I would um, spend some time, maybe go on to um, nutritionfacts.org and read about uh, soy and, and the science behind some of those, or the lack of science behind some of those, those issues that the media has played up. And do you know about any chemicals uh, being added to make the nutrition, for example, or anything uh, similar to what the regular meat has? How does it look like, the, the, the part, this part? You mean to make plant-based meats closer to animal meat from a nutritional perspective? Um, I mean, I think what the, in the US and, I, and there's an obsession with protein at the moment. I think it's spreading around the world, which is unfortunate. Um, but uh, a lot of the US plant-based meat companies have focused on protein. So if you look at like the, um, the Beyond Burger, which is um, I think launching in, in Europe pretty soon, um, They've, on their label, they've got like, I don't know how many X grams of protein, right? Because it's as much as or more than a, um, a cow burger. And so they've tended to focus on like sort of macronutrients like that, but also show that it doesn't have the same bad fats that a, a cow burger has and doesn't have the cholesterol. So I think in general, that's kind of where the focus has been to kind of make it look and taste and feel the same as the animal product and then make sure it has like massive amounts of protein because that's what everyone in America seems to want yeah. at the moment in their food. But I, I do think that um, as we start to explore the use of plant-based meats in, um, in other regions in the world, we, we have a focus at the moment, moment in GFI on India, um, keeping nutrition and even fortification in mind as we create these plant-based meats is going to be super important. Yeah. Okay, one last question. Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe just a brief question. I'm, I'm just interested about other trends in different countries apart from US. Is there anything like re really interesting coming up or some, uh, I saw Germany, uh, I guess, I guess Netherlands as well are, are the markets for that, but maybe there's another country or yeah, or the, did you see yeah. any other trends coming up? Yeah. It's really global. Um, and uh, so if even clean meat, um, those 20 companies I mentioned, there's, um, there's three in Israel, um, there's a company in Japan, there's um, several now starting in, in Europe, there's one starting in uh, Australia. So the, while, and clean meat started in the Netherlands, right? Mark Post was, well, I'm not sure if it started there, but he was the first one to make a, an actual uh, clean meat product that people ate. Um, so it's really a global phenomenon, and I think on the plant-based meat side it is as well. We see huge growth in Europe, um, in the UK, for example, where I'm from, there's um, massive growth in um, plant-based meat products. Tesco hired a, um, a plant-based meat chef to lead their um, and, and help develop their menu of um, plant-based meat products, um, and they they. I read that they, there was, there's a company in the Netherlands that um, launched a plant-based uh, steak and they launched it in the UK at Tesco um, and it sold out um, almost immediately. So um, Europe, massive growth, but also in, in Asia as well, we're seeing um, a lot of interest and a lot of growth and um, not a lot of growth yet in some of the developing regions, but it's an area of interest and focus for us because we, we see a lot of promise um, introducing these these products there, particularly as the sort of uh, Western uh, taste for lots of meat, animal meat, spreads around the world. If we can reach these developing countries first with um, better, more ethical, more nutritious alternatives, then we hope that they're likely just to eat those rather than um, massive amounts of animal meat. Last one. Lucky me. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I could see you were a speaker also at the Impact C conference today. Uh, so my question is a bit related to the previous one. Uh, actually, what kind of arguments you see are working the best when you're talking to uh, companies from um, uh, food industry, meat industry, 
when you try to encourage them to switch their production more into the plant-based options? Yeah. yeah, so what's been really amazing, so I've been at, at the Good Food Institute about nine months now. Um, we're a two-year-old organization. Um, and what I've seen and, I, and what my colleagues that have been there since the beginning have seen is, is quite the contrary. So companies like big meat companies and global food companies and smaller food companies are, are coming to us to ask us to educate them and help them on um, understanding this industry better and helping them move into this space. So we work with most of the large food companies to help their scientists understand, at least uh, me and my team work with their scientists to help them better understand the science of what I just talked to you about so that they can start to make more plant-based meat products and even start to move into the, into the clean meat industry. Um, so the only people that I think are um, somewhat uh, reserved or nervous at the moment or, or where we see the most questions is the farming community which I understand, right? I mean, they make their, their living from um, growing animals for food, and they're concerned about what, what they're gonna do in the future. Um, I don't think that, uh, I think the jobs are just gonna change, right? People are gonna, instead of um, growing animals on farms, they can work in factories that produce clean meat or plant-based meat. So there's still gonna be jobs that just, hopefully won't be jobs that require people to grow and kill animals in massive amounts. Great. Thank you, David. Thank you very much.